Geometry. Das ist eine schöne Jungs für die Uh, the stick is fine. Okay, well, thanks uh, most of all to the organizers for uh, allowing me to present my work here. I will talk about friction and inertia. And, th and the question is indeed, does inertia induce stick, stick fri stick slip friction? Uh, before we start, I'd like to introduce, uh, except myself, who, is, who has been introduced, my collaborators. I work in the group of Mathieu Villar in Lausanne. Uh, and I collaborate uh, with Marco Popovic, who is a, a postdoc in our group, who will present uh, after coffee. Wang Chang Yi, who is a PhD student in our group, and Alberto Rosso in Paris. So the million dollar question in friction is, um, in solid friction, is you slide one solid block over a solid s surface and you apply a force. How much force does it cost to start sliding? Um, well. The question is a little bit more complicated than that because when we zoom into the interfaces, we find that the interfaces are actually rough. So the interfaces consist of local uh, alpine landscapes um, of hills, which are called asperities, and a fraction of these asperities are glued together. And so when they're glued together, they can resist uh, deformation elastically until a certain yield stress in which they shear off and they, and they detach. So we have sort of a yielding event there. And now the question that we ask is, how do these asperity detachment couple to the elasticity of the bulk materials? Now we can, we can dream of two scenarios. The first is avalanches. I don't need to explain, uh, but I will still highlight um, a few things that are there important that we consider to be important. So in an avalanche, one detachment of one asperity triggers another detachment of an, of an asperity, but not necessarily the neighbor. So it could be in the vicinity, but not necessarily the neighbor. So some fractal object could be formed. Um, if, if this scenario is true, often the, de the detachment will couple, but they will not detach the whole interface. They will not destabilize the whole interface at once. So that will result in a sort of smooth stress strain response. The other uh, scenario that we have is fracture. And a fracture, instead of these detachments that couple at some distance, it's actually the detachment of one asperity will detach the neighbor and that will detach the neighbor. So there's a clear rupture front that propagates to the interface. Um, these rupture fronts, they will be unstable, so they will span the entire interface. And consequently, the, consequently there will be a finite stress drop or we will observe stick slip friction. And it presumably inertia is uh, is the way to to step from one of these two from the avalanche scenario to the stick slip scenario. Okay, so we ask which picture fits friction in the presence of inertia? Is it avalanches or is it in fact a fracture? And suppose that it is fracture, which has been suggested in experiments in friction. Um, if it's fracture, how is this fracture actually nucleated? So to approach this question, uh, I consider a disordered continuum model. So disordered to preserve the discrete nature of these asperities and their detachment, uh, and continuum because it will allow me to treat elasticity and inertia trivially, and in this community I should, I should say that we treat the real elasticity and the real inertia. <laughs> so long range and, and full inertia, not, not some perturbation around some overdamped dynamics. And well, sort of bonus question, but actually uh, something that we're really interested in, is this system will allow me to also address the question, is the pinning actually hysteretic in the presence of inertia or not? All right, so the model that I treat looks as follows. So I have two elastic uh, um, bulk materials that are shown in blue, and in between there's the weak layer um, of the asperities that are that can detach of each other. So the here these are the deep these two blue are the bulk elastic material. They're simply assumed linear elastically. And here is what's happening. Uh, here's the attachment, the, the detachment and the reattachment of asperities. So we model this in a mesoscopic way. Before I address this, I, I first want to measure that we drive the system quasi statically. So we I apply a, a deformation here at the boundary, but I do it very, very, very slowly. And at the bottom, I fix the system. 
so okay it is continuum so i use um, tools from continuum mechanics in particular finite elements to discretize the system uh, and then i discretize in time also and that gives me a, a, an equation of motion that i can solve furthermore i assume periodicity in horizontal direction now the detachment and reattachment of asperities is models as follows so the elasticity is simply linear elasticity and in, a, in an energetic perspective, this is a quadri quadratic potential energy in terms of strain. The detachment and reattachment of asperities is local yielding. So an asperity behaves linear elastically up to a certain yield stress or strain, and then it will detach, it will shear off, or it will shear transform, it will release its elastic energy, and it will move forward to some new position new around some new minimum in which it can behave elastically again. Okay, so what is now the, the crucial thing about inertia? So at long times we know very well what happens. Um, and I will illustrate what, happe what happens for inertia here by, the event by studying just one yield event. So in dark red here, this is the yielding of a block. And now we, we consider what happens to its nearest neighbor. And the nearest neighbor is here a bit brighter. So this is what happens to the yielding block. It yielded at the yield stress of, of one, it dropped, it released its uh, elastic energy, and now we look at the neighbor, and at long times, it has to carry a bit more stress, right? As has the next, na the, the neighbor after that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is at long times, but at short times, there's a transient effect, because actually the yielding of this block emits elastic waves. Um, and the elastic waves cause a temporary stress overshoot, you see this here. And so this temporary stress overshoot can destabilize you even when you would have been stable at long time. So this is the, the, the crucial bit of inertia. And so now when we plug this all in the model and we drive the model, we, uh, we observe this. So here's the stress versus strain response. And first the response is elastic and then it reaches some steady state and it reaches a steady state stick slip friction. All right, so things are looking pretty well for this fracture uh, scenario. Now let's consider what happens um, after a, 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 a period of, of stick. So after a period of stick, there's a nucleation of some big event that will destabilize the system. And when we look what happens, um, it, it is best to show just a movie. So what I plot here is the, the stress distribution um, of this block. And now I, I hold it just before it, start it nucleated this big event and we will see what happens. So the color dark here means there's a lot of stress, bright means there's very few stress. And now, so the system nucleates, and what we observe is, well, first of all, we observe that there's a clear rupture of contact propagated to the system. Second, we observe a lot of mechanical noise, right? We, we observe a lot of oscillations, and these are these oscillations that come from the inertia. So these are these elastic waves that were tr transmitted and that travel through my sample. So, okay. Things are looking really good for this fracture uh, scenario. We had this clear rupture front, um, but maybe not. So what happened after this uh, nucleation of this big event, the stress dropped, the, the entire system was destabilized, and you noticed maybe that blocks kept yielding over and over and over again until the system stops, and it, it stops at, at some residual stress that I will call a sigma down, sigma bottom. And the residual stress is actually a very uh, is actually a critical stress for our system, and that is the stress that the system can carry in the presence of inertia. So, in the presence of all these elastic waves, the system will stop at the sigma bottom. Now, in between the sigma bottom and the nucleation, um, there's actually events, and these events did not nucleate this fracture. So, maybe these events can tell us something uh, about the nucleation. So these events did not grow unstable, so maybe if we understand why they did not grow unstable, we understand also what nucleates this big fracture. Um, and okay, to study them we lack actually statistics because there are events but they're not so many. So to cheat, to, cheat, to cheat statistics a little bit, we trigger manually events and we particularly trigger events at different stresses and different stresses in compared to uh, sigma bottom. So this delta sigma that, you, that I will show throughout the next slides is the distance from this sigma bottom. So zero is actually the blue line and one is actually the red line. 
So what I can do is I can measure the distribution of avalanche areas. So avalanche areas here for me is the really the, the number of blocks that yielded at least once. So it's sort of the linear extension. Um, and the colors here in this diagram means increasing stresses. So the dark color here is uh, delta sigma zero. The, the brighter color here is delta sigma is one. And so the, the stress increases this way. And so first of all, at this uh, critical stress, we see that we have uh, a nice power law distribution of avalanche area. Now, okay, in this community, it's also uh, relevant to, uh, to report that we can also measure the distribution of avalanche sizes. Um, so this is literally the number of times that things have yielded. Um, and for the distribution of avalanche si sizes, we measure the mean field depending exponent of 1.5. Independently, we can also measure the fractal dimension, so the relationship between an avalanche size and an avalanche area, uh, which we measure to be 1.7. So, 1.7. So these are rather compact objects, actually. And together, we can also check, and this is consistent with our individual measure of uh, of the density of uh, of avalanche areas. Okay. So this is what we have. Um, what it actually what uh, what actually seems to happen is from this nice power law. Actually, there seems to be a cutoff that, that decreases in size with increasing stress. So there could be a critical nucleation radius that is actually stress dependent. And this critical nucleation radius has been, understand, uh, has been understood in fracture mechanics. So here's what I picture is what happens. So the system is uh, at a certain stress and here's the weak layer. Uh, and, and let's say that it's average, uh, that it's everywhere the same stress uh, sigma. Now, an event will be nucleated, an avalanche will be nucleated here, and uh, the avalanche will grow at, at a certain area. And now, because there is an avalanche, there is yielding, there's a lot of mechanical noise. So there's a, a lot of waves being transmitted, and th this, will have, this will result in that the blocks inside this avalanche will yield over and over and over again. And so because of that, locally inside the avalanche, the stress will drop to this sigma bottom, sigma down. Um, whereas the rest of the system is still at this original sigma. So actually this avalanche acts like a pre-crack, and a, a pre-crack which is not classical in the, in the fracture mechanics sense. It, it is not a crack that can carry no stress, but it is a crack that can carry some residual stress sigma bottom. And now, Griffith already came up with an argument um, that there will be a critical radius beyond which the, the pre-crack will not be able to stop. So if the pre-crack has a certain critical radius, um, beyond that it will simply propagate throughout the whole system. And so he came up with a scaling argument in, com in uh, um, relating the, the size of this pre-crack to the distance uh, to, well, to the stress, but in our case, to the distance to the sigma bottom. And this is the scaling relation. So, okay. so we believe that this picture is true, but can we actually check it? Well, yes, we can, because we can actually measure the cutoff of these uh, distributions that have a cutoff at lower and lower and lower uh, area at higher and higher stress. And when we compare this, we, we find a very nice fit with, with this picture. So, so here's, our intermediate conclusions, conclusion, what actually happens is that these avalanche nucleate fracture, and we, we come up with a Griffith-like sort of argument. Now the remaining question in the next two minutes is, can we say something about the typical stress drop? And can we say something whether stick slip will persist in the thermodynamic limit or not? And to that extent, we do a scaling argument. And then we say that, okay, fracture will be nucleated by an avalanche, when um, the number of avalanches is sufficient to nucleate a big event by chance. So we can compute or we can express the number of avalanches and we can express the fraction of avalanches that will be, yeah, three minutes, yeah, I, I will try. So we can, um, we can express the number of avalanches and we as a function of stress and we can exp express the fraction of avalanches that will nucleate this fracture, and when the product is, uh, is order one, we say that, okay, this big event will be nucleated and this will give me in this, this upper stress. 
so to express the number of avalanches, we measure the distribution of distance to local distance to yielding, P of x, which I don't have to explain in this community. And partly to our uh, surprise, we measure in the presence of inertia, we still measure a pseudo gap. So even after this huge avalanche, there's still a couple of blocks that are on the edge of yielding. So th this is quite in contrast to a gap in which there would be no guys on the edge of yielding. And we measure uh, an exponent which is actually quite high. And I, I, I put a little disclaimer here. Um, what I've shown you before seems to be pretty um, consistent or universal in our system. Um, but this exponent actually seems to, be seems to depend on the microscopic details. Now with this, we can do a scaling argument. I, I will not explain this in the interest of time. So we can express the number of avalanches as a function of the system size um, and the stress at which we work as a function of this uh, power theta. Uh, and well, this uh, I, don't, I really don't have to explain here. We can also um, express the fraction of avalanches that will nucleate this fracture. And when we put this together, we get an expression for the typical stress drop as a function of system size, so number of blocks. And we see that uh, the stress drop decreases with increasing system size. Um, so in the infinite limit, in an infinite system, the stress drop will be zero. So stick-slip friction will disappear. Or hysteresis in the pinning will disappear. However, it does so very, very slowly. So actually, if we wave our hands, we can, we can um, estimate that any, in any realistic system, the stress drop will actually persist. Um, a disclaimer here is that the scaling argument we can verify every step individually, so uh, that makes us pretty confident. Um, and a bit of a surprise here is that when we reinsert this Griffith criterion, we find that the nucleation radi radius is actually uh, governed by the system size and it diverges with the system size. So this brings me to the conclusion. So the stress drop goes to, uh, to zero in the infinite limit. In any real system, it will probably persist. Uh, the fact that there's a little dependence on microscopic details will allow engineering. Um, well, we have at least the mechanism is in agreement with experiments. I don't have time to explain, but please come find me, I will explain. Um, another disclaimer is this was a very simple model. Uh, so we want to move to a more realistic setting to understand uh, if, if our uh, arguments uh, hold there. Um, and in particular, we want to stu study in 3D the spatial structure, um, but we want to also introduce stress homogeneities, uh, study also more the font dynamics. With that, I'd like to thank you for attention. So the classical uh, Burridge-Knopov model has a, a velocity weakening. Um, and actually, we have a velocity weakening. This inertia is this velocity weakening. So in fact, we believe that it, it naturally has this uh, velocity weakening me mechanism um, in itself. Um, and so we believe that, that actually this is a sort of a microscopic model of a, of a, well, of a more mesoscopic Burridge-Knopov model. Okay, so the disclaimer is, since I assumed a continuum that allowed me to do many things, I, I lost the concept of normal stress. So in fact, our model is sort of at a, at a, at a constant normal stress. So well, so my gut feeling is that uh, the rupture velocity will depend on the stress at which things nucleate. Um, and that's we are yet to check. If I check the rupture velocity at this sigma top, in which the system nucleated itself, they're all the same and they're all super shear, just by uh, uh, 
So, so thanks for your question, and actually thanks for adding to my list. In, indeed, we, we believe that we can move towards really a rate and state picture, um, but with microscopic arguments. So this would be nice. Um, introducing this time dependence is, is maybe like introducing a little bit of temperature in our system. And what, it will, what the temperature will allow the system to do is it will allow it to become more stable, mostly. So, yeah. And so, so it will emphasize actually the stick slip friction uh, effect. So, but we're actually moving exactly in this direction. So the, the word fracture is nice because it allowed me to make the connection to fracture mechanics easily. But it, it's potentially a little bit deceiving in the sense that there's no classical fracture in our systems. The, the, these uh, asperities, they can detach and reattach and detach and reattach at different locations. Yes, yeah, so I, I just want to make the point that what we believe is fracture is a, is a very clear rupture front in which detachments really open the, the interface like a zipper. An avalanche is more a, a, a fractal object in which there's no clear uh, zipper moving through our system, but there's more detachments in the, in the vicinity. So that is, the, that is the distinction that I wanted to make. Um, not much more. I, I don't believe that these scenarios are uniquely identifiable ever, everywhere. Um, now, if you ask, does this picture also hold in an amorphous solid? Because I think that is what you're asking. Um, the answer is maybe. There could still be this nucleation picture. Um, but then it depends, I think, largely on how compact or, 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 uh, or not these avalanches will be. So this nucleation was there because these avalanches are relatively compact. And inside this con compact object, there was a lot of mechanical noise going on, and that locally weakened me, and that allowed me to nucleate something bigger, which had a, a clear well, a bubble in, th in 3D or, or just a clear front in 2D. Um, whether that will hold in the, in the real amorphous solid with, uh, with particles, it depends largely on how, how compact or not compact these avalanches will be for the mechanical noise to kick in. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you should be worried, and and as will we actually. Uh, <laughs> so, ex completely correct. So what we introduced is we introduced a little bit of damping, which uh, mimics the fact that we leak energy at the boundaries, so that that, that they won't reflect. Uh, yeah, exactly. Otherwise, they would zing through the system. Yeah, yeah, it would be terrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah so your your worry is correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I'm glad you asked because thi thi this I didn't uh, thi this I didn't explain. So, so here on the bottom right, this is my simulation. So, on the vertical axis, there's time. On the horizontal axis, there's space. And so I draw a dot every time there's a yield event. And so what we what we observe is there's first some well, it's too small potentially, but there's first a, a, an avalanche in which there's really not necessarily nearest neighbors being triggered. And then after a certain critical radius, there's a very clear, sharp rupture front that propagates to the system. 
So the radio wave speed does not exist in my system because I, I assume to continuum. But let's say the shear wave speed. Uh, and actually, we find two times the, the, the shear wave speed. And so the famous square root of two, that's a, a sort of a bottom. So we cannot be, uh, we can be either below the shear wave speed or above the square root of two she times the shear wave speed, but we can be above and we find actually that we're at two times the shear wave speed. So supersonic. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I th there's real not an really not a notion of an interface uh, because of my continuum. We do think about an in interface, of course. Well, we didn't consider the uh, the the, um, the dynamics of the avalanche themselves. Yeah, yeah, the, b the beginning, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but well, I, I agree. I, I spent many, many hours just watching these kind of plots, and then we figured we need to do statistics because. Uh, well, no, s well, so they're pretty compact ob objects, so, so they're in, in, in some sense, they are propagating. But how exactly? Uh, well, after every coffee, my, my story changed. So I thought that maybe I need to, to do something more objective. Okay, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.